five tools that should be in every RV from the perspective of a guy who's got to work on them all the time. We did part one. Um, if you haven't watched that one, make sure you go check that one out as well. I definitely recommend having those tools in your RV before you have these tools. Um, this is kind of getting into a little bit more advanced stuff if you're a DIYer and you want to make your own repairs. Um, either way, let's get into it. Number one is going to be a temperature gun. It doesn't need to be uh, a high-end brand, doesn't need to be anything fancy. Um, you're only using it for a couple things, but it is an extremely useful tool if you are an RV owner. One of the most important things you're going to do with this tool is every time you stop um, to get gas or anything like that, you're going to check the temperature of those hubs. You're not looking for a specific temperature. What you're looking for is a hub that is significantly hotter than the rest of them. For instance, if you had 100 degrees at three of your hubs and then you had one that was 200 degrees, you have an issue either with the brakes or the bearings in that hub and you're going to want to get that taken care of immediately before it becomes a catastrophic issue like an entire wheel falling off on the highway. Number two on this list is going to be something that was recommended multiple times in the first video uh, and that is going to be PEX tools. Pretty much all of the plumbing in your RV is going to be done with PEX which is plastic piping um, which believe it or not is actually in pretty much most modern homes these days too. PEX has been around for a long time and almost all modern RVs, that's really the only plumbing you're going to see is PEX. You may see some supply lines, but those are just hand threaded on or sometimes with tools as well. Um, but PEX is going to be 95% of your plumbing system. Using PEX doesn't require very much skill. You can buy PEX in half inch, which is essentially all your RV is going to have. You can buy the fittings, you can buy all that at Home Depot, Menards, Lowe's, wherever it is you shop for hardware, you can find all of that stuff available there. Um, and it's relatively inexpensive. So no matter what fittings you need, you can get. Same goes for these clamps that you're going to be using and the tools you're going to be using, which are very inexpensive, which are really just PEX cutters and PEX crimpers. And I'm going to show you how to use both of those tools. As far as the PEX cutters, just like scissors, you're going to cut your pipe to size, whatever you need, chop it off, it's that simple. Um, you're going to take your PEX crimp, put it on the pipe, and your fitting will slide right in there, just like that. You're going to want to set your PEX fitting about an eighth of an inch below the edge of the pipe, just like that. And then you're simply going to take your crimps. Once you have the PEX crimpers on the clamp, just squeeze until you can't squeeze anymore. And that's it. That connection's done. It should be leak free. If you do PEX correctly and you leave the one eighth inch gap and you crimp it all the way, you'll almost never have leaks on PEX. PEX is a little bit flexible too, so it's a little easier to work with than copper. You're not sweating copper. You're not making cuts with special tools or anything. You guys just saw how fast I did that. Um, it, it's super easy. So having these tools on board can save you a bunch of money and time when you have any kind of leaky fittings or you got a pipe that gets chewed through by a mouse or something. Uh, you can pick up PEX crimpers and cutters for less than 50 bucks. Um, Amazon even has some kits that come with the crimps and everything as well and then a few fittings like 90 degree elbows and whatnot. Um, so it's a very inexpensive tool, especially if you're going to be DIYing your own plumbing. The next tool on that list is going to be your test light. Now I know a lot of you are going to say that I set a multimeter in the first video. I recommend you have that before you have a test light because a test light is only good for 12 volt, but it's much faster and easier to use than a multimeter. I also only recommend using this tool if you know a little bit about electrical. Um, for instance, you can't stick this into anything 120 volt, you'll absolutely fry it. So you have to know the difference between what a 12 volt circuit is and a 120 volt circuit is. Um, but once you understand that, which I will shout it out, the NRVTA home study course, if you guys haven't checked it out, it's on my website. You're gonna learn so much about your electrical system and it's things that you can use outside of your RV as well. You're going to learn a lot from that. And it's going to help you understand the differences between AC and DC voltage how they both work and how they coexist in your coach. Back to our uh, normal show here. So on a test light, all you're gonna have to do is ground it to anything that is grounded. Again, taking that course will help you understand what all that means. After that, all I have to do is touch this to everything. So I have one hand being used versus a multimeter where you're trying to hold a meter, you're trying to hold your ground probe and you're trying to hold your hot probe it's a little more difficult versus this one tool in my hand where I can just check and see what's going on. Now this test light is a little fancier because this test light will also show me a good ground as well as a good hot 12 volt. Um, 
you don't necessarily need this. This one's made by Power Probe. I absolutely love it for that reason because I can also detect a good ground um, as well as a good 12 volt source. And I know you can't see it, but it is also vibrating in my hands. Every time I get a good 12 volt source, it's gonna give me vibration too, so I get all kinds of feedback from this tool. So if you're looking for a good test light, the Power Probe test light is amazing, but any 12 volt test light will do the job. Um, some people prefer the ones that show them voltage. Um, I prefer this one, that's all gonna be preference, but again, a test light, a 12 volt test light is an amazing tool to have in your RV. This next one is something I'm gonna put on the list of uh, really cheap insurance, and it is gonna save you money down the road. Um, a lot of you have probably heard of what a leak down test is. It's essentially testing your propane system for leaks. Uh, and the way the dealership does that is with a manometer. So purchasing a manometer, you don't need to use one this fancy. I'm gonna show you a cheaper one. Um, using a manometer, once you know how to do it and you know how to do a leak down test in your particular coach, you can do it almost every time you're camping. Uh, it'll give you a lot more peace of mind knowing you don't have leaks, or if you suspect a leak, it's much easier to verify that versus having to go to the dealer um, for something like that. So it's a test that you can do in just a few minutes and I'm gonna show you how to do one. So real quick, before you do a drop test, you're gonna to wanna to turn your water heater off, make sure your heater's off and make sure anything else that runs on propane is off, including your refrigerator if it's hooked up to propane as well. So now getting to the drop test, most of these you can do from the stove. Um, some newer RVs started using some fancier stoves, so none of this looks the same and it's not as accessible. So there are some other options I, I will show you. You can do it from the Quick Connect on the coach if you have an LP Quick Connect, which again, most modern RV co RVs do have uh, an LP Quick Connect on the outside and you can build an adapter to do that. If you happen to have a stove where you can pull the top off and access the burners like this, it makes it much easier. This is the cheaper manometer I was discussing. You can get one of these for maybe 50 bucks. Um, and I'm gonna show you what it is you're looking for on here to determine if you have a leak. So first, after we remove that burner, there's just one single screw. You're gonna connect this to the orifice. And um, I don't know if I mentioned it already, propane needs to be off before you start any of this. Uh, pressurized system and then turn propane off. So once we turn it all the way up, you can see we're about 14 inches of water column, which is all right. Um, that should be the regulated pressure. And then what I'm gonna do after that is I'm going to slightly open another one of these burners until I get that meter down to about eight. So it's gonna sit and kind of float there as I have this on, and then it will start dropping quickly. So you have to catch it quickly. That's why I recommend not turning that burner on all the way. So we're sitting just at about eight there. It's about where you want it. And you're gonna to wanna to let it sit for three minutes and you do not wanna see that needle drop. That's gonna indicate a leak. So you want it to stay at about eight for about three minutes and that is a drop test. If your needle begins to go, continue to go up, that can be from temperature fluctuations. You can try bleeding a little more. If it continues to go up, you have an issue with a valve um, on your tank or something like that that is still allowing propane to come into the system even when it's in the off position. I don't want to get too deep into the LP drop test because that deserves to be a video on its own. And now that I'm talking about it, um, in the next couple days I will probably just make an entire video about an LP drop test, a regulator lockup test. Um, and a few other tests you can do with a manometer. Again, you can pick one of these up for about 50 bucks. It'll save you money, it'll give you a peace of mind, and it's really cheap insurance, especially when you're considering what it's testing for, which is a propane leak, which is never good in any capacity. And for your very last one, it is going to be wire strippers and crimpers. Um, if you're doing any kind of DIY, even simple stuff with electrical, you're gonna need this. Um, you don't need fancy snap-on ones. You can get cheap stripper and crimpers, um, but you're gonna love yourself for getting the nicer ones. At least Klein, Milwaukee, something along those lines. And that's really just for the stripper part of it. Um, those cheap strippers are really gonna frustrate you. Um, one of the biggest uses is even simple things, replacing marker lights and stuff. Your strippers, putting a new light on, most of the time it's not going to be stripped. So you can strip that wire off 
and do the same thing on the two wires that are coming out of the coach, your power wires, which I just kind of have mocked up there. You can strip those as well. And then you'll use the crimper portion of it. And again, they do make, uh, you can get separate strippers and crimpers as two separate tools so that you don't have to actually have just the one tool, but this is just a preference because then you only have one tool. Um, outside of the strippers and crimpers, what you're gonna want is a good assortment of butt connectors. Um, they make both waterproof ones, like this one. Uh, you can heat this up afterwards, and this is heat shrink tubing that will go on there. And then you have your standard ones that you'd use anywhere that is not in a wet condition. Now, before I get into the actual butt connectors and how to crimp, um, for you DIYers, I will say, as much as I don't like them, you can use Wagos, W-A-G-O. Um, they are as simple as can be. They're okay for things like this. I don't like using them anywhere outside of 12 volt. Um, they're great for setting up mock stuff for me. That's why I keep them. I don't ever use these for a permanent connection, but they are, they are certified to be used for electrical. They have been for a while. They use them everywhere. Um, they're probably already all over your RV. So if you want to, you can use these because they are as simple as sticking the wire in there, closing the little clip, and then you'd stick your other wire in the other side, clip it closed, and your connection's made with no tools except for stripping the wire. Again, I'm not a big fan of them, but they are an approved device to be used on electrical. I wouldn't use them on anything 120 volt, but it is what it is. So they make standard and heat shrink butt connectors like I was saying. So using butt connectors is simple. You get the wire, make sure it makes it into the metal portion of the crimp. Get it in your crimpers. On your crimpers, you're gonna see two spots. It'll say insulated and non-insulated. This is considered an insulated one. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you use that crimper so that you don't tear through the insulation on the waterproof connector. And then you're gonna take the other side of your wire, get that inside the butt connector. Do the same thing. And you have a solid connection. Now that we have that crimped, again, this is gonna be an outside connection, so we use the waterproof connector. And the next step to making it waterproof is taking heat and applying it to that heat shrink so that it shrinks around the wire and keeps any moisture from getting to that bare metal and corroding it. And I'll kind of show you what that looks like once this is all sealed up. So now you can see that that is all sealed up nice and is a good exterior connection. Any of uh, your electric brakes, um, exterior lighting, any wire connections that are outside the coach should always be done with a waterproof connector. Um, when you're working with the inside of the coach, you can use a standard connector like this one. It doesn't have any of that heat shrink on it but connecting wires is just as simple as that with one simple tool. And for those of you who have stuck around for the entire video, my bonus tool that I have for you guys is gonna be a multi-tool. I've carried a Gerber since I was like 13 years old, and I'm gonna be honest, this is probably my most used tool. If there's any tool in this entire box that touches my hands the most, it's probably this because it's on my hip all day. I use it inside, outside of work. I have pliers, I have strippers, I have crimpers. I have an actual usable screwdriver. This is the Gerber center drive if you're interested in finding something that actually has a usable screwdriver. Um, I have a second bit there, which is my number two square and my Phillips, the only two things you'll ever need in an RV. Um, I have a little pry bar, I have a knife, I have a scratch all, and I have a file and a saw. Tools that I use every day. So that is your bonus tool. If you've never owned a multi-tool, again, if you're gonna buy one of these, buy something quality, Gerber, Leatherman, something like that. Um, and again, this one is the Gerber center drive. It is by far the best multi-tool that I've ever owned. And I have owned many different high-end multi-tools. My last Gerber lasted me 12 years. Uh, I'm only six months into owning one of these, but I absolutely love it. Again, if you have not watched the first part of this video, I recommend you watch that. Five tools that should be in every RV. Those are the basics um, for pretty much most DIY and adjustments around the coach. This list is kind of more for the people that are actually getting into some of their DIYs and wanting to get some actual repairs done like lighting and electronics and things like that. 
Uh, the next best tip I have for you guys is, of course, if you want to see more tips, tricks, and tours in RVs from an RV technician, make sure you guys press that subscribe button.